Bertrand Russell's Objections to the Argument from Design, from his essay, Why I'm Not a Christian. We're going to begin at the beginning of the section where Russell considers his objections to the argument from design. Like any good philosopher, he starts by giving the argument that he's objecting to. The next step in this process brings us to the argument from design. You all know the argument from design. Everything in the world is made just so that we can manage to live in the world. And if the world was ever so little different, we could not manage to live in it. That is the argument from design. So we'll remember in our previous assignment that we saw a version of this. I called it the third teleological argument from fine tuning. So here are the premises to this argument. One, everything in the world is made just so that we can manage to live in the world. If the world was ever so little different, we could not manage to live in it. The third premise, the most likely explanation for these conditions is that a powerful and vastly intelligent designer created them. And this designer is God. So this argument doesn't come from William Paley. It is a later version of the argument. And I'm going to explain it now premise by premise so that it makes sense. Starting with premise one, everything in the world is made just so that we can manage to live in the world. So the idea here is that when we look at some of the details of the world, there seem to be all kinds of things that must be made just so that we can manage to live in the world. There seem to be an unlimited number of examples that support this observation. One example might be that humans breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide and plants can use this carbon dioxide to create oxygen, right? It just seems like a system that works so well that it had to be set up. This seems to be an arrangement that's made just so that we can manage to live in the world. All right, moving on to the second premise. If the world was ever so little different, we could not manage to live in it. So this premise is claiming that if these conditions are made just so that we can manage to live in the world, if these conditions were just even a little bit different, we actually wouldn't be able to live in this world. So returning to our example of humans and plants, if plants were a little bit less efficient at turning the carbon dioxide that we breathe out into oxygen, then there might not be enough oxygen on our planet to support humans. You see the idea here? So physical forces like gravity are also included as the conditions that are made just so that we can manage to live in the world. If the gravity on Earth was just a little bit less or just a little bit more, then it would probably be the case that our planet would be uninhabitable, at least by us. So even very small changes to the way that the world is made could lead to a version of the world that was uninhabitable for humans. The world needs to be very finely tuned so that it's possible for it to exist as we know it. This is where the fine tuning part of this argument comes from. All right, we'll move on to premise three. And the conclusion, given this, the most likely explanation for the world being made just so that we can manage to live in the world is that a powerful and vastly intelligent designer created it. And then, of course, this designer is God. So according to the fine-tuning argument, it's more probable that a supernatural designer exists than that just by chance or through some other explanation, the universe is fine-tuned in the way that it is. So to put this another way, the likelihood of the existence of a supernatural designer is quite high, given that the universe is fine-tuned in the way that it is, namely a way that allows us to live here. So it's possible to present the fine-tuning argument as a Bayesian inference, which is well established, which is a well-established form of scientific reasoning involving conditional probabilities as both inputs and outputs. So this premise claims that it would be unlikely for the world to be made just so that we can manage to live in the world or to be so finely tuned that it's possible for it to exist by chance or by any other explanation. The more probable reason that the world is the way that it is is because of a powerful and vastly intelligent designer created it this way. 
Now notice that this is a probability rather than a certainty. In this particular argument, this probability is understood to be a strength and not a weakness because of the way that the probability allows the argument to connect with the probabilistic reasoning and science, right? So Bayesianism involves probabilistic reasoning, and by applying that uh, to this argument for God, it is actually ends up being a strength because it's using the tools of science, in this case Bayesian reasoning, to come to its conclusion. All right, so now that we've gone through each of the premises, we'll review the argument one more time before we move on to Russell's objections. So the third teleological argument from fine-tuning, premise one, everything in the world is made just so that we can manage to live in the world. If the world was ever so little different, we could not manage to live in it. The most likely explanation for these conditions is that a powerful and vastly intelligent designer created them. And finally, this designer is God. Okay, now we're going to move on to Russell's objections to this argument. He gives us three. The first objection that Russell gives us that we're going to consider is what I call the adaptation objection. So here is the text. It's an easy argument to parody. You all know Voltaire's remark that obviously the nose was designed to be such a fit for the spectacles. That sort of parody has turned out to be not nearly so wide of the mark as it might have seemed in the 18th century, because since the time of Darwin, we understand much better why living creatures are adapted to their environment. It's not that their environment was made to be suitable to them, but that they grew to be suitable to it. And that's the basis of an adaptation. There is no evidence of design about it. So what's going on here? Well, it's not that the environment was made to be suitable for the things living in it, according to Russell's objection. Instead, the things living in the environment grew to be suitable for the environment that they live in. There's no evidence of design about it. So the adaptation objection is basically claiming that it's not the case that the environment was made suitable for the things living in it. Instead, those things living in it grew to be suitable for their environment, and so there is no design involved. All right, let's consider Russell's second objection. It's called the it's a bad design objection. At least it's called that by me. The text. When you come to look into this argument from design, it's a most astonishing thing that people can believe that this world, with all the things that are in it, with all its defects, should be the best that omnipotence and omniscience has been able to produce in millions of years. I really cannot believe it. Do you think that if you were granted omnipotence and omniscience in millions of years in which to perfect your world, you could produce nothing better? than the Ku Klux Klan or the fascists? All right, so how does this objection work? Well, according to Russell, it seems strange to think that this world with all of its flaws and defects is the best that could be created by an omnipotent, which is all-powerful, an omniscient, which is all-knowing, being in millions of years. Do you think that if you were granted omnipotence and omniscience and millions of years in which to perfect your world, you could produce nothing better than the Ku Klux Klan or the fascists? So the idea with this objection is that Russell is pointing to all of the flaws in the world, and then he's pointing to all of the power that God as the designer is allegedly supposed to have. And he's claiming that according to him, these two things don't add up. It doesn't make any sense that God would be all-powerful and all-knowing and create the world that we live in with all of its flaws. All right, let's consider the third objection. This is what I'm calling the life of the solar system objection. We'll take a look at the text. Moreover, if you accept the ordinary laws of science, you have to suppose that human life in general, on this planet, will die out in due course. It's a stage in the decay of the solar system. At a certain stage of decay, 
you get the sort of conditions of temperature and so forth which are suitable for protoplasm. And there is life for a short time in the life of the whole solar system. You see in the moon the sort of thing to which the earth is tending, something dead, cold, and lifeless. All right, how does this objection work? Well, Russell's pointing out that science shows us that life on Earth will only exist for a short time in the life of the whole solar system. So given this, it's strange to think that God would carefully design our world if it only exists with, uh, with life on it in such a short time in this life of the whole solar system. So the idea behind this objection is that, look, if God is in fact the designer, uh, it sure seems strange that he's designing uh, for such a small period of time during which we live on the earth in the whole grand scope of the lifetime of the universe, right? So the problem is, is that it seems strange that God would design things in such a way that he did if really life on earth is just a tiny piece of the whole history of the earth as a planet in the universe. All right. So to review the third teleological argument, the fine tuning version, premise one, everything in the world is made just so that we can manage to live in the world. Premise two, if the world was ever so little different, we could not manage to live in it. The most likely explanation of these conditions is that a powerful and vastly intelligent designer created them. And this designer is God. Now we'll also look at Russell's objections. Remember, there was the adaptation objection. There's the it's a bad design objection. And then there was the life of the solar system objection. So what do you think? Do you agree with Russell? Even if you do agree, how might you respond to him? And especially if you don't agree, how might you respond to his objections? <laughs>